This is Let's Get Growing with horticulturalist Nathan Wilson at Lanier Nursery and Gardens in Flowery Branch. Get information you need for gardening, landscaping, and home plant care. We're taking your calls right now at 706-865-3181 or email info at wrwh.com. Now, here's Nathan. Well, welcome, gang, to Let's Get Growing. I am your host, Nathan Wilson. So glad you're here with us on this wonderful Saturday morning. Um, I want to go ahead and let you know that today's program, we are going to be talking all about deer. Probably a big problem in your garden. We get that kind of, uh, those kind of questions about deer. What plants should I use? How can I keep deer away? We get those questions all the time at the nursery, and I've just noticed that it's so popular that we need to probably focus uh, our attention on it and some time. So this morning, actually, all day, we're going to talk about deer. We won't be able to take any phone calls because I'm actually uh, not in the studio. This morning, I am at Chicopee Agriculture Center in South Hall County, just south of Gainesville. Uh, We're at the Master Gardener Plant Expo, and we'll be here all day. So So definitely come on down if you want to um, look at some of the vendors. Of course, Lanier Nursery and Gardens will be there, and we will uh, be here till 4, just uh, talking with people, showing them around uh, our, our our booths and whatnot, and we have plenty of plants available for your pleasure, and uh, some great plants, actually. So, um, like I said, we won't be taking phone calls, but... Uh, we'll be down here at the Chicopee Agricultural Center in um, Hall County. That's uh, just south of Gainesville. And uh, come and visit us for sure. And while you're down in South Hall, definitely check us out at Lanier Nursery and Gardens. Uh, if you go to Chicopee Agricultural Center today, we're only about five miles away or so. We're very close to the Agriculture Center, and we uh, definitely look forward to uh, showing you around the nursery. And, of course, even more plants. If you're uh, looking and kind of in the market for getting your garden in shape this fall, you definitely want to come down and see us uh, this weekend. But anyhow, uh, if if you're just joining us on the program, uh, maybe you haven't been listening to let's get growing Uh, we want to let you know that you can watch our old shows and i say watch because we do have a a video aspect on facebook live you can go to wrwh um, on the facebook page or you can go to youtube.com and there you'll be able to watch any old shows that we have and or listen we kind of started the um, videos just a few weeks ago so we have a few of those and some are audio but either way if you want to catch up and listen to some phone calls that we've answered or email questions that we've answered you can feel free to go check out youtube and facebook also if you aren't aware you can listen to wrwh anytime on your mobile phone yes that's right your smartphone i know sometimes these phones seem smarter than we are Uh, but if you just go to wherever you buy your apps it's a free app Um, it's called tune in so go to your app store and it, like I said, it's not, you don't have to pay for it, it's free, uh, but you just download TuneIn app, and once you do that, you will want to search WRWH, and from there, you'll be able to listen to all the great programming that you're used to hearing at 93.9 and uh, 1350, so feel free to do that as well, and we love to stay in touch, so definitely like WRWH's Facebook page, and um, you can always ask questions there if you have questions uh, for the garden program here at Let's Get Growing, or if you want to send a message feel free to email info at wrwh.com that's info info at wrwh.com we'll be glad to take your questions there and in the future i'll give you an answer for sure we love to do that but today's program like i was uh, mentioning earlier i'm going to talk all about deer the next hour we're going to talk about how deer uh, learn a little bit about them their characteristics um how they feed because if we're going to try to battle them in our gardens we need to know a little bit about them we're also going to uh take a look at five different ways that you can and successfully uh, integrate uh, methods to uh, keep deer away. Now, you know, a lot of you there are probably shaking your heads. I can see you shaking your head. No, I can't get my deer away. Well, yes, you can if you just stay on top of it. Deer are what I call a 200-pound pest. You know, we're used to aphids, which <laughs> you have to look for under a microscope just to see them. But these deer, of course, they're huge, and they're always in the landscape, Um uh, we're going to learn about how they, they operate a little bit uh, later on. 
But the reality is 200 pound pest, how do we get rid of it? Well, let me start off with the obvious reason, uh, obvious way. I mean, the obvious way to get rid of them is obviously by hunting them. However, there are state laws, local laws that you need to obey and follow. And so I'm not going to dwell or discuss that in this program. You find the laws. If you're a hunter, you know how to do that. But we're going to talk about um, applicable ways that you can do uh, use in your garden uh, to make sure that the pressure of deer is, is less obvious. That's, that's the case. So the reality is that it is tough. But if we stick to it, if, if we try different things, I think we'll find success. And we have to start when we think about deer as, you know, what is the problem? That's the reality. The problem is that uh, our natural habit, their natural habitat is being lost to our roads, our homes and buildings. And so the deer begin to spend more time in the areas that we're populating, which is really your backyard, you know? So we're kind of infiltrating their space and we have to realize that they have nowhere else to go because we're where they used to be, or where they've always been, we should say. So, I, you know, in most cases, we've kind of pushed them into the woods so far that now we're into the woods with them. And so, of course, as they're scavenging, looking for berries, nuts, uh, foliage, um, roots, whatever is on their palate for the day, they, uh, they're they going to come across our gardens. And most likely, if you you have a deer problem, you probably see the the trails that they're making all through the garden. So that's the reality here is that we've got to realize that we're not, we are on a battlefield, but it's less of a battlefield and it's like a roommate. (laughs) Okay. That's the way I like to describe it. Yes, we're trying to fight them and they're our enemy, but in the same rate, we're living in the same spot that they are. So Uh, What that means is we really have to work to uh, figure out how they're moving, what they're doing in the landscape. We're going to give you some pointers on on that as well. So I do want to start off our discussion here and and just make a quick disclaimer, okay? (laughs) If we talk about plants uh, and which plants are deer resistant and which plants are not, I want to let you know that deer are like teenagers, Okay, you're like, what does that mean? Deer are like teenagers. If they're hungry enough, they will eat anything. They will. They will. I mean, I'm convinced that if a deer is hungry enough, he'll poke his head through your front window and grab your firstborn. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if, if they do these kinds of things, uh, we just have to realize that, hey, look, this is who they are. This is what they are. So how do we fight that? Well, let's start off and let me give you some quick characteristics about deer. Okay. One deer... Each deer that is in your deer herd can consume 5 to 10 pounds of plant material every day. Let me say that again. Each deer can consume 5 to 10 pounds of plant material each day. Now, let's put this in perspective, okay? One head of iceberg lettuce. Let's say you go to the grocery store and you pick up an iceberg lettuce. Give or take, that, is, that head of lettuce is going to be about a pound or so. Okay, some are looser, some are tighter, some are heavier, some are lighter. But uh, if you can imagine one deer eating five to ten pounds of lettuce a day, and here's the problem. They're not eating that lettuce. They're eating the lettuce in your yard. They're eating your leaves, not the lettuce from the grocery store. That's for sure. So keeping that in mind, deer are going to eat a lot of food. They're going to eat a lot of stuff. And unfortunately, a lot of that stuff may be in your backyard or front yard or side yard or on your deck. Uh, whatever. Now, another thing we need to keep uh, another thing we need to keep in mind about deer is that they tend to feed at night. Okay, so generally they remain awake until dawn and they're feeding at night. Now, yes, when I give this presentation about deer uh, to garden groups and whatnot, somebody says, "Well, the deer eat the grass. Uh, eat, the deer eat my plants all day long." They do. <laughs> so it's possible, but generally they're creatures of night. Okay, and so we have to realize that we're trying to fight this pest that uh, is eating at nighttime when we're asleep. So when we're awake, they're asleep. When they're awake, we're asleep, generally speaking. Okay, So we have to keep that in mind, that we're not just going to be able to shoo them away all the time because we're going to be asleep, generally, when they're out and roaming around. Also, they are creatures of habit. See, they... um, You can use their pathways, their movement patterns, or where they've ate before, kind of predict where damage is going to occur. You can be like a meteorologist (laughs) of your deer population. You can expect the deer to come back and to use the same patterns of movement through the garden. 
And so with that in mind, you're going to be a little smarter than they are because you're going to know, hey, they're creatures of habit and they're walking the same trail every day, day after day, going back and forth. Okay, And if they're bedding, they're probably going to bed in some of the same areas. So if you can locate where they're bedding, well, then you can grab them on that front too. And also where they're eating. Okay, they come to this corner, so I don't want to plant my hydrangea where they come and eat all the time. We want to plant the hydrangea where they're less likely to come or where their habit is not going. So those are a few things that you can do to get out and um, kind of learn the deer in your population. Another thing is you want to keep in mind that they have very good memories. Deer are very smart and they can remember a lot. And on top of that, they learn from each other. So let me uh, put it this way. A lot of people can complain about, oh, the deer ate this plant and it's not supposed to be a plant that the deer like. Why did they eat it? Well, sometimes it may be because a young deer came around. You remember when you're a teenager, when you're a young human <laughs> and you want to experience things and you want to try things? Uh, yeah, you know, you never know what kind of trouble you get into. But the deer can do the same thing, and they do it with food. They're going to try something new. These young deers, these uh, uh, fawns and whatnot, they're going to go and they're going to eat things that may not taste so good. So you may see damage uh, by deer, but it may not be a permanent kind of damage. It's just this deer is learning um, what is good and what is bad uh, for it to eat. And so with that in mind, um, they can also, these young deer can learn from, say, the grandmas and the grandpas of the herd. So uh, keeping, keeping in mind, Mind that you may have young deer and you may have older deer. These are important things to keep in mind because you just never, uh, you never, if you're not watching, you don't know the age of the deer. And so if you're watching every day, keeping notes, you do see some babies, you may expect some damage to plants then that deer don't normally like just because they're young. But uh, like I said, the grandmas are teaching the young ones. So <laughs> eventually uh, you'll see um, them all going away from uh, these uh, kind of experience and trial periods. But um, some things that can change a deer's feeding habit may be, you know, nutritional needs. What What is it that they actually need? Uh, season availability. So like throughout the seasons, what is available for the, for the deer to eat? In other words, if it's wintertime and you have some plants like, say, arborvitaes or cypress, these things have a fragrance. They're not necessarily some, something that a deer would love to eat. But in the wintertime, just because of the season, they may go and attempt to eat some of these things that they don't normally eat. Why? Well, just generally, there's nothing else to eat. So the availability of plant material is going to change um, their feeding habits for sure. So kind of in the wintertime, expect to see some of these evergreen plants that they normally don't eat. They may try to eat just because there's nothing else to eat. Um, of course, um, alternative foods. If, if there's nothing else for them to eat in the wild or they've scavenged everything or the pressure of the population is so heavy, they may be coming to your garden because there is nothing else for them to eat. No berries out in the wild. Uh, maybe no, um, they've eaten all the leaves they can at eye level or the, their height of level or whatever. So some of these things can, can change their feeding habits for sure. And uh, you can keep these things in mind uh, so that you can expect damage at certain times of the year and expect certain types of damage to certain types of plants throughout the year and just get an overall sense of, okay, it's going to be all right. Yes, they're eating this or eating that, but that's not where we're going to be able to stop. You know, we're not going to be able to stop there. We've got to go further. Now, I'm going to give you um, in the next coming segments, we're going to uh, be closing out here for the first segment, but um, I'm going to give you five methods that you can use to help keep deer away from your plants. And I want to make sure, though, that you understand that what, we're, what I'm proposing to you is that you have to use a combination of these types, of these different uh, methods here. You know, everybody, we, we want a quick fix. We want a spray that's going to kill it. We want a, a powder that's going to do away with it. But the reality is, is, is with a 200-pound pest, there's not just a quick fix for this. We're going to have to use a multiple, uh, excuse me, a variety of different types of, uh, of control methods in order to make sure that a deer's, the, the presence of deer in our landscape is not as powerful as it could be if we didn't do anything. So like I said, I believe that you can do this. I know that you can. 
And uh, it's just going to take a little persistence. It's going to take a little understanding of the deer, which we've already talked about. And it's going to take just enacting these next steps, whichever ones make sense for you, whichever ones make the best sense for you to use. I would definitely encourage you to use them just to get an idea and a feel for your deer. Because one thing you have to remember is that deer in one landscape is not going to be the same uh, deer in another. So your neighbor's yard is going to be completely different than for your yard and the guy, your friend down in uh, the other county or the other town is probably going to have a different set of deer. So hang on tight. We'll be right back and I'm going to give you five surefire ways that you can keep deer out of your landscape. We'll be right back. For live editions of Let's Get Growing, tune in Saturday mornings at 9 here on WRWH. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. All right. Well, welcome back, gang. We're uh, heading on with our discussion about deer this morning. Of course, we have just talked a little bit about uh, the characteristics of deer and how they operate, what they want from life, what they uh, do during your uh, night, the night hours in your garden, and of course, how they move. And it is important to um, uh, kind of keep all those factors in mind when you are determining how bad your uh, deer, pre- pre- the presence of deer might be in your landscape. But uh, let's jump right in to talking about uh, the five different different ways that you can um, create a deer resistant garden and like I mentioned in the first segment we want to make sure that uh, we are oh what's the word that we are staying on top and integrating a a lot of methods not just one method because one method is not going to be enough to get rid of this 200 pound pest we're going to have to do a lot of different things so I'm going to give you a lot of ideas and then whichever ones uh, suit you best Those are the things that I would encourage you to then go out and do. Now, let's start off. Number one, you want to monitor and observe uh, the deer population and the pressure that the deer are putting onto your garden. In other words, you first of all want to make sure that the, the, the damage you're seeing on the deer, on the plants, actually comes from deer. Because if it's not coming from deer, but maybe another mammal, uh, you would be going the wrong route. For instance, it is hard to confuse um, deer damage. It's hard to let's see. It's, it's, it's hard to confuse deer damage and rabbit damage. But I want to give you an easy way to figure out which one is which. First of all, um, deer they are like cows. Okay, they have a bottom set of teeth and no top teeth. Okay, they've got the lower but not the upper, and they are like cows in that they'll pull at the plants. They'll pull at grass, they'll pull at your leaves, and so you'll see a very jagged and rough edge on their uh, f- damage from deer. Now, damage from rabbits, on the other hand, if you remember Bugs Bunny, he has a top set of teeth. He has two sets of teeth, uppers and lowers, and he doesn't pull at food, he bites at food. So the d- rabbit damage is going to be much cleaner cut than deer damage. Deer damage is going to look as pulled and ripped apart where rabbit damage will look like it has actually been um, uh, cleanly cut, maybe with a pair of scissors, you know. So look for that. Now, here's another uh, another thing. <laughs> you know, hostas stay low to the ground. And if, you, you know, you can easily confuse rabbit and deer damage with something that stays low to the ground. Now, obviously, if the damage is above your, is, is waist, uh, waist high or breast high and it's not deer damage. You got a problem with your rabbits. That's for sure. Because there is not going to be a rabbit that's going to be climbing trees to uh, uh, take bites out of your leaves. So you know, with hostas and low-growing plants, you may find that you are getting a little bit of both rabbit and deer, perhaps. But the higher branches, most likely, yes, will probably be deer. Another thing is you want to know how and where are they traveling? How are they moving around the landscape? What are they doing? Where are they going? Do they bed in your landscape? If they're if they're sleeping in your landscape. You probably got some big problems. You need to. You, they're going to be there. Uh, easy access to your all night buffet, right? I was consulting with a guy, a client, and he wanted to do a hydrangea and hosta this kind of woodland garden in the backyard. Well, he had a chain link fence, okay, and I was all for it. And then he said, "Oh, and over there on the other side of the fence, uh, that's where the deer sleep." And I was like, are you kidding me? Uh, you know, your chain link fence is only about breast high. It's not really going to uh, help the deer. But I, I wouldn't uh, really advise using hostas and hydrangeas if the deer are sleeping right on the other side of the fence. That's for sure. And uh, how large is the herd? Uh, if you have a herd of three, 
maybe a mama and two babies, uh, you know, you're not going to have much to worry about. But if you have a, a herd of 13, 15, 20, which I have seen, I have seen that many in, a, in one herd, you know, you're going to have a huge uh, pressure from, um, f- from the deer. Uh, an- another question is, what is the hurdle generation gap? Uh, the hurdle generation gap, what I mean is, I mentioned in the first segment, you know, you've got young deer and you've got older deer. If you've got uh, a bunch of young deer in a population, you may have a bunch of adventurous youngsters who are out to try anything in the landscape. But if you have older uh, deer, you know, grandmas and grandpas and the maws and the paws, then they're less likely to eat the things that they don't like but the young deer may try it and experience and you may see a lot of damage just because of there being so many juveniles in the herd so that is what we call monitoring and observing i want you to take notes and records figure out what the deer like in your garden figure out what they don't like because like i mentioned the the deer down the street it may not be the same deer that's at your place and they may not like the same foods. So, you know, you can look at these plant lists, uh, which we have available at Lanier Nursery and Gardens. If you'd like a copy, you can uh, check us out on Facebook or something uh, or come see us. But uh, anyhow, we have these lists. And of course, the lists have good plants in them, uh, but the deer in your landscape, they may prefer it. They may prefer the, li- the, the, you know, it's like they didn't read that list, you know, the, the deer didn't read it. So they, uh, they don't know they're not supposed to like it, but regardless, they may or may not. So that's why I like to say, take these notes and get prepared. That's the first step is to monitor and observe uh, the deer in your landscape. Number two, the second thing I want to talk about is using physical barriers. You see, a physical barrier can really help. Okay, physical barriers meaning like fences or netting and whatnot. Those are two physical barriers that I would recommend. But of course, if you go with fencing, you're going to find that you have a budget there. You know, you're going to, and it may not be practical. You may not be able to fence in 22 acres of land if you have that much land, or maybe not even a quarter of an acre if, uh, you know, it's not in the budget. But if you're going to use fencing, use something sturdy, obviously. Use something tall, at least eight, at least six foot, but really eight foot tall is what we're talking about. So this thing may become gaudy. It may not look very pleasant in the landscape. And so that's why it may not be the best option for you. But netting may be. If you have a vegetable garden, I'll tell you, uh, we uh, grow some vegetables. And at the vegetable garden, we raise these posts. They're about 12, I guess 10 to 12 foot tall. And um, we wrap it in netting. So we wrap the whole garden in netting. And it does seem to work. The netting is probably five to six foot wide and you just stack that on itself so do one layer a wrap and then wrap the top of your um of your posts and you can encase your whole land your whole garden space in this netting but of course that's not going to look too hot that's going to look too good when you talk about um you know, uh, ornamentals and whatnot. You can't just put a net around your whole front yard. Nobody's going to, that's not going to go too well. So that may not work. But uh, something else that may work is called the wireless deer fence. Now, this is found in extension research. It's a product that's been around since the 90s. But uh, the extension folks say it works. Go to uh, wirelessdeerfence.com or just Google wireless deer fence and you'll find these little posts. They are battery operated. They're, they're of just about the height of a deer's nose and they have electrodes in the top so it's like a stick with electrodes in the top you put the batteries in the bottom and in the middle of the electrodes is a a, something that smells very good for the deer and they want to figure out what it is and then when they walk over to this wireless deer fence just this little post with these electrodes in the top they want to smell what that bait is and then it gives them a nice electric shock now it doesn't hurt the deer okay it just scares them away and you can see some videos of this product in action on the website at wirelessdeerfence.com and uh, it, it does work. And you could place these in the pathways, you know, in their their modes of action, the, uh, the trails they're making. Place them in the pathways, and that way you're deterring them from following that same trail, hopefully moving their trail out of your landscape, preferably into your neighbor's or somebody else's yard, you know. So uh, an, another physical barrier you can use that's very cheap is fishing line. Just go down to uh, the hardware store or to your bait shop and grab a roll of fishing line. And what you want to do is you want to twine and wind, twine, twine and wind, I don't know. So twine it all around the plants that are um, being affected and create a what we call web of confusion. You want to make this kind of spider web all over your plants or around maybe some sticks above your plants. And that web of confusion then is they're going to get their nose in those 
strings and they're not going to know what in the world this is and they're going to back away and less likely for them to eat it if they don't know what it is. So that would be another really cheap way. Uh, Lastly, as far as a physical barrier goes, is you would want to go and get a uh, certain length of chicken wire. Go get some chicken wire, crumple it up, and place it around your beds. And when they start stepping on that chicken wire, they have no clue what it is. You've got to make sure you crumple it up. You know, just a thin gauge chicken wire, put it right on top of the mulch, let them step all over it, and they don't know what they're stepping on. This feels weird to them. They're going to move away, and less likely that they're going to want to attack and eat your plants. So again, you can use fencing, you can use netting. Uh, those are probably higher on the budget though but you can go and get the wireless deer fence which is battery operated easily moved around no wiring or anything you have to worry about chicken wire you can uh, chicken wire as far as putting on the ground and uh, confusing them and lastly the fishing line you can make a web of confusion so see these are just a few ways that you can use physical barriers to get deer out of the landscape now hang on tight because when we come back we are going to talk about repellents and i know you're dying to hear about repellents because they're all over the place and there's a lot of different kinds and i'm going to make it very very easy and just break it down to you about deer repellents. We'll be right back. Tune in Saturday mornings at 9 here on WRWH for live editions of Let's Get Growing. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. Okay, gang, welcome back to Let's Get Growing. I'm your host, Nathan Wilson. Today, we are talking about deer because there are so many problems with deer in the landscape. I found out that a lot of people are asking those kinds of questions at Lanier Nursery and Gardens, at least. So I have went and done some research about how can we create an integrated approach, you know, a comprehensive approach to getting de- rid of deer in the landscape. People want to buy plants that are deer resistant, and some of them are. But sometimes they're not always deer resistant because the deer want to try new things. So today, of course, like I said, we're not in the studio, so I'm not taking your questions. Um, I'm actually at uh, Chicopee Agriculture Center with the uh, uh, Hall County Master Gardener. It's a plant expo. It's uh, nurseries like Lanier Nursery and Gardens, some other nurseries and small growers. And we're all down there and we are uh, selling plants. And of course, um, we'll be there until four. So you can stop by if you'd like and see what is available um, at the Master Gardener Expo in uh, South Hall County. But while you're down there in Oakwood, you might as well come visit me at Lanier Nursery and Gardens. How about that? We're just about five miles or so down the road from the Ag Center. And we'll be glad to show you even more plants and uh, we even have plant lists there uh, as far as deer resistant plants go so if you want a plant list feel free to ask for one Um, if you're just joining us with let's get growing and and you're not familiar with the show but you really like gardening and you like to have your questions answered (laughs) i was about to say answered questions now if you like to have your questions answered uh, you can listen to old shows and watch old shows at uh, facebook just search wrwh And also, you can go to YouTube.com, search WRWH Radio, and you will find Let's Get Growing there with Nathan Wilson. We've got all of our old shows there that you can reference for your uh, listening and watching pleasure. And also, if you're not going to be around a radio, you can listen to WRWH on your cell phone, your smartphone. Just go to wherever you um, download your apps, and you can get the free app. It's called TuneIn. That's T. U-N-E-I-N, tune in. Just download TuneIn app and you can search WRWH and you can listen on the go if you're not near a radio. Mm, that's kind of nice. Listen on the go if you're not near a radio. So be sure to do that and uh, we'll keep in touch and you can hear all of your um, great programming from WRWH at the TuneIn app. So let's get back into talking about deer because they are a problem in the landscape. We've already talked a little bit about who they are, what they do, what they like, what they don't like, and how we can kind of expect to um, uh, approach uh, getting rid of them. As I've mentioned before, this is a 200-pound pest. You know, they're almost 200 pounds, I guess. I don't know how heavy a deer is, but we know that they're less than, uh, I guess, at least as heavy as we are in most cases, or at least a big dog. And uh, it's not as easy just to spray a chemical and get rid of them because they're a mammal and they're huge. So what can we do about that? Well, we've talked about uh, using physical barriers, a number of things we can do there, mixing it up, adding in new features into the landscape to kind of surprise them a little bit. But we will talk about repellents. So let's talk about that. We talked about physical barriers. We're going to talk about repellents now. 
repellents have been all the rage, and there are some good repellents. There's some bad ones, and there are some that work for some people and some that don't work for some. At least that's what I'm getting. But at Lanier Nursery and Gardens, we work with Bonide. Now, Bonide is a maker of chemistries and organic controls, and they've been doing that for so long because they like helping the growers. And so that's what they did. That There were two brothers who started the company, and actually it was New York, but they, they ran a hotel, and in the hotel they were hearing farmers when they would come to buy feed and seed from the uh, uh, local supply companies that farmers would talk about their problems and you know issues well bon i jumped in and started making products just for growers just for agriculture and horticulture you know some of the big guys out there are like well i won't say any names but some of the big guys they make medicine and they make chemicals that go in your landscape bon i just strictly makes chemicals and uh, organic controls for the landscape so i do encourage you to check out bon I products because they got some good products as far as repellents go they're um they're deer and really all mammal repellent is called repels all now repels all's primary ingredient this is why i love bonite because you know what's in there they list it on the bottle you can see that it says putrescent egg whites on the bottle that basically is rotten eggs okay so we have an organic product you can spray onto your foliage of the plant it has some other um uh, smelly oils in there that deer don't like and Repels all works because of the sense of smell. It targets the sense of smell for animals. They do not like it. They do not want to be around it, so they leave. Now, another product you can use from Bonite is called Go Away. Now, Go Away uh, works for rabbits and deer and, and other critters like that. And you spray it, you apply it to the leaves, and the, um, the deer or the animal tastes this plant uh, taste the chemical on the plant and they don't want to eat anymore because the active ingredient of go away is capsaicin now, that's a big fancy word for you know we don't really care about big fancy words but what that is is that is the main product the main oils that are found in hot peppers like cayenne and so these have been extracted from peppers of course you rub it in your eyes it's going to hurt it's going to kill you if you're just going to rub your eyes away but um for the same thing goes for a deer's tongue i'm not a big fan of hot and spicy things um and so go away is great i mean yes you, that that plant that the animal has to kind of bite it first but at least it won't want to eat anymore once it finds out that that stuff tastes terrible for them now another product that bonide makes is called sentinels and sentinels is a system uh, it's like a wicking system it's kind of like potpourri for the garden that's what i like to call it because it, in this uh, Sentinel's uh, repellent system, you get six uh, little vials, you get a bottle of oil, and you get six wicks. And you put the wicks into the little vials, and you pour the fluid, the oils, which is mainly like peppermint and clove. It really smells like Christmas time when you use Sentinel's in the garden. It's going to be great, especially here coming up pretty soon. We're almost to Christmas. But anyhow, you put it into the vials, you put the wick in there, and the uh, wick pulls that oil out of the vial and th that uh, permeates the, uh, the area, the landscape that is all around your tree. If you have an apple tree, hang it from the apple tree. If you have a hydrangea, you just hang it from the uh, stems of the plant and it permeates the surrounding area. So it comes with six, uh, uh, six vials that goes a long ways for at least six different uh, zones in your landscape, maybe the hot spots, and you can utilize that. You don't have to go and uh, spray or apply the oil to the plant. You just use the oil in the vial. So it's very easy uh, to to do and you know something you could try in addition to some of these other things um, lastly there is a product that has really been treated more like a fertilizer because it's an organic fertilizer it's got a small amount of nitrogen and phosphorus and great source of iron it's called milorganite now maybe you're familiar with milorganite um, milorganite and let me just make it clear i don't get paid for many of these people <laughs> so um, i'm encouraging the use of these products because they work not because somebody's telling me to uh, but milorganite is a good product because it smells like humans to them and uh and as well as creating the smell out in the um garden uh, you can smell it too i mean it's kind of an organic -y smell not the best thing but just an organic fertilizer 
you're also adding a biological matter to the soil and you're feeding the soil and feeding your plants. So it's like a two for one. You get some deer control, but you're feeding your plants as well and adding organic matter, adding iron and nitrogen to the soil. And so it is a good two for one. Uh, that's mill organite and it's easily accessible. We actually sell it for cheaper than the box stores at Lanier Nursery and Gardens. So I'll let you know that if you are on a budget, you can save a couple of bucks by uh, purchasing it from us. But uh, regardless, using the right repellents can work okay and using repellents is an important part of what we're doing here but repellents repellents are definitely something that we want to do a little bit about repellents we've got to talk about frightening the fiends i I say we want to frighten the fiends uh how can we frighten deer this is another way you can integrate uh measures of control for deer the first thing you could do is you could use a dog man's best friend a domesticated dog can help now the problem with that is that uh you know you there may be leash laws and where you live and if there are you can't just let the dog roam free yes barking would help but once the deer find out that the barking doesn't come with a bite or doesn't come with a chase at least they're probably not going to be as effective Uh, it's just a resounding gong for the deer that that barking but um, it it would be best if the dog was loose but of course you know like i said we can't always do that so it may not work but you could also use radios and radios work people used to put radios out in the landscape of course you can um, you know play wrwh from the radio for the deer all night long if you'd like Um, our voices would probably scare them but the problem is the radios really only work if you're moving them around the landscape and that's the biggest deal is we, we we never really go out there and move them do we we play the radio we put them out there but we never really move it and it just becomes again white noise in the background there's no harm here i'm get the deer is getting used to the noise and it's really just not working so radios can work if they're moved frequently around the landscape Another thing that really works are the little motion sensing, the noisemakers. And, you know, since we're coming on to Halloween pretty soon, uh, in a month or so, uh, they'll be going on sale afterwards, I guess. You'd probably go buy them right now. I'm sure they're out with all the decor. But the motion sensor uh, noisemakers, you know, maybe it's a goblin or a witch or something. And when you walk by it, it scares all the little kids on the front porch. And then they get their candy and they're happy. Well, you can use the same thing out in the garden. And every time that that uh, noisemaker, whatever it is, is triggered, you're going to scare the deer. You know, that they're not going to get a piece of candy, that's for sure. They're going to run away. So it's like using a radio, using a scary sound, but uh, you don't have to move it like you would a radio because every time it's triggered, it's a new threat and the deer will run away. So that works as well. Another thing, uh, as far as a scare tactic goes, is irrigation. You can purchase um, sensor motion irrigation systems. So it's basically, um, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah basically a sprinkler <laughs> that hooks up to your hose, but it has a, no, a, a sensor on it. And what the sensor does is every time the deer walk past, the, the water turns on and it scares them away. So very much like the noisemaker, the irrigation um, scaring systems, irrigation uh, motion sensors can also work as well. So those are two ways you can do that. Now, another way that I didn't find in any of the research, but some something that someone told me about, this is a, a story from someone that and they claim that it works very well, and I think it does take some some good consideration, um, is a laser-projected lighting. Now, these laser-projected lightings, you can actually get them either online or around Christmas time. This is this new um, kind of way to decorate, and you may have seen them last year, but uh, it's a, a light you plug into the outlet, you point it somewhere, and it kind of displays a little laser show. And, you know, it's little flecks of this color or that or whatever, and these lights are dancing around and moving. Now, the individual who told me about these and using them for deer, he says he places them where he wants to protect And anywhere where that light's not, the deer are eating. But if that light is positioned on a plant or a certain section of the garden, the deer won't go over there. So I think that even though that is not necessarily uh, in the extension research, the cooperative extension research that I went to, I think that it takes a little, it should, it has a value there. It should take some consideration to use um, this um, laser projected lighting. And like I said, you'll be able to find those pretty soon around Christmas time. Uh, That's um, something you could get uh, maybe even before online. But regardless, we want to make sure that we integrate some aspect of frightening the fiends. Frighten Bambi and her mama and daddy with either a domesticated dog, 
You can use a radio. You just have to move the radio around for it to be effective. You can use the uh, the motion sensor uh, noise makers that you're going to find around Halloween. Get a witch or a goblin and, and scare those um, scare those deer away. Or you can use a motion sensor irrigation system, which I say system. It's really just one uh, nozzle unit that you place into the ground uh, with a little stake, and it turns on and off uh, whenever deer um, trip the sensor. I think that one's going to be a cool one for you because the laser projection lighting uh, you will be able to enjoy at nighttime, of course, uh, kind of little sparkles in the trees. Um, but at the same time, you know that that laser lighting is working to keep the deer away. So again, this segment, we've talked about repellents um, from bonide, melorganite, and we've talked about scaring the scaring the creatures, scaring the deer to get them out of your landscape. And uh, when we come back, I'm going to give you my last point, which is using and combining plants. This is what everybody wants to talk about, the plants, right? So we're going to come back in just a few moments, and we're going to talk about how you can use plants and how you can use plants together uh, to make sure that deer don't like your landscape. Hang on tight, folks. We'll be right back. Let's get growing Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. on WRWH. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. Well, welcome back, gang, to Let's Get Growing. Of course, I'm your host, Nathan Wilson, and all all morning we have been talking about deer. You know, deer are a problem in the landscape. They definitely have done a lot of things <laughs> to a lot of people because when they come, people come into the nursery to shop for plants, the number one question is, do deer eat this? Now, I can't always say, yes, deer eat it, and no, deer don't. Because deer are like teenagers. If they're hungry enough, they'll eat anything. So I want you to keep that in mind. That is my disclaimer. Whenever I give a talk about deer or am discussing deer in the landscape, I have to say that uh, deer are like teenagers. If they are hungry enough, they will eat anything. I would not put it against them. If they're hungry enough, they will poke their heads through your front window and grab your firstborn. But uh, in, in all reality, deer are a problem. And all morning we've been talking about what we can do. So definitely, if you've missed any part of this program, what you need to do whenever we're finished here in a few moments is go to YouTube.com and search WRWH, and in a few hours, you'll see the program listed up there, and you'll be able to listen to all of the points and all of the tactics that we're going to use to help keep deer out of landscapes. Folks, it's more than just the plants. Plants are very important, but it's more than just the plants. And I think you once you start using and integrating and they're taking a comprehensive approach to deer control, you'll find better success. So be sure to check out on YouTube.com or Facebook. You can find more information about Let's Get Growing and how you can listen to the entire program. But uh, talking about plants, this is our last point uh, for deer control. Plants are important. We definitely need to select them and combine them appropriately so that we get good control and that we are more likely um, to see deer um, not in our gardens. So the first thing that I would say is to reduce the number of deer attractive plants. Get rid of the plants that deer like, or don't get rid of them, but use them somewhere else. For the plants that deer like, like hostas and hydrangeas, I would say group those a little closer to the house. Now, I've given this talk before, and several people say, well, it doesn't matter if it's near the house or not. The deer are going to eat it. So put the, put the, if you have to have plants that deer absolutely love, put them someplace else, not right on the fringes of your landscape. Put them where the deer are not. That's, that's all that um, idea that I gave you about monitoring where they're going. Put those kinds of plants where the deer are not. Secondly, you want to increase the use of deer-resistant plants. Okay, deer-resistant plants. You want to increase the use. So reduce the number of plants that they do like and increase the number of plants that they don't like. Now, those kinds of lists, of course, we have available at Lanier Nursery and Gardens, and we can show you some plants in the nursery if you'd like. But again, that disclaimer is they may or may not be always deer-proof. But if you um, do use plants that we know deer don't like, let me give you one, um, anise, a uh, small anise, the small anise tree or yellow anise, got a lot of different names, Elysium is another name. When you crush the leaves, it smells very much like licorice, and the deer do not like that plant. So if you use these plants kind of as a border out away from the landscape, maybe towards the edge of the property line, and make thick hedges, uh, alleys or whatnot, and the deer approach those, 
and they don't want to go any further. Perhaps that would help to keep deer away from the landscape. But use those kinds of plants further away where the deer, or at least where the deer are moving. But where the deer are not moving, you can use those plants. Maybe, okay? <laughs> now, another thing that you want to do uh, with plants is keep a record of the plants that deer in your area don't like. Because my lists at the nursery, I mean, they're good lists and all, but uh, the reality is is that they may or may not be uh, liked by the deer in your areas. It, just like the plants in somebody else's lawn two or three miles away, they may or may not be the same plants in your lawn that the deer like. So it's always really dependent on your area. And this is just part of the reality of gardening, is we just want to keep a record, uh, get an idea of what's what and what's going where. Um, another thing that you want to keep in mind, let me tell you a little bit about deer. I didn't talk about this early on, but deer like open grasslands or open woodlands like a prairie because they're, pre- uh, they're, they're prey. Remember, they're not predators. They get eaten. So they do not like to be in confined spaces. Unfortunately, we're humans and we like open prairie lands too, you know, just like the uh, Indians out west. They made their villages just in the open prairie so they could see if something was coming for them, see if the, someone was going to attack them. Uh, same with woodlands, you know, you keep an, a lot of a lot of times we like to keep our cl- woodlands cleared. And so we have big trees but no little shrubs underneath. But we have lawns, don't we? Lawns. And I think every man in America just loves to have the turf grass. But I say complicate your garden design. Don't just keep an open woodland or open um, prairie, you know, a, a lawn, Bermuda or fescue or whatever. You want to make sure that you um, kind of complicate the garden a bit. You can use large beds in the front. You can use large beds on the side. You can do islands. You can um, put a, a border around the, the front of your property, maybe. Something that so that the deer uh, look and they say, I don't want to get caught um, red-handed in there. I don't want to get, I don't want to walk around that hedge and find a wolf or something, you know, uh, or you. And so make sure that you're using uh, plants in such a way that you're complicating the garden design. Uh, in my experience, the people with some of the, the most deer pressure are people who keep their woodlands cleared without um, shrubs and whatnot. And they also keep their lawn in the front just wall to wall, you know, velvet, I'm not velvet, but uh, green carpeting from property line to property line, you know, just like a carpet of, of lawn there. And those kinds of landscapes really see problems with deer. Now, lastly, as far as selecting and combining plants, I don't have time to talk about certain plants and and just list off a bunch of plants for you. That may be a little boring, but I would rather get you to thinking and get your mind about what kinds of plants deer may or may not like. So some characteristics of deer resistant plants would include plants that have strong scents, uh, particularly in the leaves or the flowers. You know, I mentioned anise. Of course, when you crush that leaf, it smells very strong. You know, lantana and catmint, those kinds of things, they smell. Chives, if you got a vegetable garden, use some chives out there because they're very strong, uh, strongly scented like garlic, right? And um, unpalatable or bitter leaves, plants that don't taste so good. You know, they may taste good to us, like some of the mints and chives, they may taste good to us, but for deer, they're not going to be very palatable. Uh, thirdly, um, something thick or leathery, you know, just for an example, just think of like Southern Magnolia, not that you have to use that plant, but Southern Magnolia has thick and leathery leaves. Or also uh, fuzzy or bristly leaves, things that have little spines, spiny textures, those types of things. Mountain mint, uh, thyme, anise, of course, marigold, all of these plants are plants that you can use in large groups to help keep deer away. Um, Or at least deer not eating those plants, you know. So those are basically... Um, some of the tips that I give when I talk about plants to garden groups and whatnot, uh, again, that would be you got to monitor and observe the deer in your area, see where they're moving, see how many there are, uh, see what they're doing in your landscape. Number two, you can use physical barriers, go out with fencing, netting, the wireless deer fence we talked about, web of confusion, all of these things. Uh, thirdly, uh, repellents, of course, bonite and melorganite, and you can frighten them. That's number four. Frighten them with radios or motion sensors. Uh, sensor noisemakers, things like that. And you can also uh, select and combine plants in a certain way that's more effective than just placing them randomly and keeping wide open turf areas where they're more likely to graze. So I hope that these are getting you thinking. These uh, points are getting you thinking, um, getting you some ideas. And 
my approach would be to use a few of them and try them. Not just one, not just one. It's going to take several, but look in the areas that need the most protection and get them started. Folks, it's been a fast one hour of Let's Get Growing. We do this every week at nine o'clock. So be sure uh, to come, come back or you can check us out on YouTube and uh, Facebook at WRWH and you can get more ideas for your lawn and garden. And that is my job. I'm your personal gardener to give you ideas. So meet me back here next week and we will be ready to answer your questions on Let's Get Growing. And folks, let's do that. Let's get growing together. Thanks for joining us for today's Let's Get Growing program with Nathan Wilson. If you have a comment about today's program, you can reach out to Nathan by sending an email to grow at LanierNurseryGardens.com. Join us next Saturday for Let's Get Growing on Local News Radio 93.9 FM and AM 1350.